baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Two portions of Scripture. We'll start with Genesis 1 and 1, and then we're going to head back, clear to the back, to Revelations, the 20th chapter, and verse 9 to 11. Genesis 1 and 1, and Revelations 20, 9 to 11. I know a lot of us can quote Genesis 1 and 1. It's not a very long one, but we'll turn there anyways, just in case, because sometimes I have a habit of... Uh, saying the wrong thing. Even when it's in front of me, I've uh, made a few mistakes and said a few blunders. Genesis 1 and 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And now to Revelations, the 20th chapter, verses 9 to 11. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Praise God. This morning I want to take a few moments, and I want to speak on this subject. He's still in control. Praise God. He's still in control. Brother Christopherson, would you pray at this time? Hallelujah. Oh, minister, Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, just have your way in this service this morning. Touch hearts, Lord. Minister to us, I pray. Oh, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Shake hands with somebody and you may be seated. Praise God. He's still in control. Praise God. Control. What is control? Control is to have power, to have dominion, to govern, or to reign over something. And uh, everybody likes to have a little bit of control. Everybody likes to, to rule over something. You know, They like to have the, the say over something. But there's some that, that want it all. They want all the control. They want all the power. They want everything to be under them. And in 1997, we have a lot of people that want to be in control. And just who are they? Well, the first one that, that I believe is, that is trying to take control is the government. The government is trying to take control. We all have a, a social insurance, a social number and uh, we all have a health card number we all have a driver's license number you know at work I have a number everything is a number all we are is a number and the government they can punch up anything and they can find out where you live they know what kind of car you drive they know how many people are in your family they know everything about you that maybe you don't even know that they knew about you and they have today cellular phones out and uh, I heard a story about a preacher who had a cellular phone. And he was heading to the Texas border. And he was driving in his car. And just as he crossed the border, his phone rang. And the, when he picked it up and he said, hello, it said, hello there. It was a recorded message. And it said, hello, I, we just want to welcome you to Texas. Well, how did they know he was in Texas? Because if you don't know, there's satellites that are over above Earth. And they're able to pick up barcodes, 
they're able to read off of chips. And there's certain chips that are in your cellular phone because they're electronic. And this way, when they came in, this preacher had the cellular phone. They were able to pick up and find out that he had just crossed the border into Texas. That, that's amazing. That just blew my mind away. And uh, my car, it, it has a serial number on it, but it also has a barcode. If you look closely, I, I don't know when they installed it, but, but my car has a barcode. And any laser can read a barcode. And now the government, they've come up with this 407 express, express toll route. And all you have to do is buy a transmitter. You don't have to pay anything. You get on, and when you get on the ramp, they have a little thing set up, a computer set up, that reads your transmitter. And it says that you just entered there. And then when you want to get off, the off ramp has a computer too. And it reads your, your transmitter, and it says where you've gotten off. And if you don't want to buy a transmitter, they have cameras. So that when you get on, it takes a picture of your license plate. And when you get off, it takes a picture again. So they, what they do is they charge you monthly. They know exactly where you get on. They know exactly where you get off. And if they can do that for a highway, imagine what they can do everywhere else. Who says that they're not reading that transmitter for everything else? Who says they're not going to say, I want you to put a transmitter in your house for certain things, for your computer? Brother Christopherson and I were talking about computers, actually, last night, and we were saying how that if you hook up into the Internet, if you use your modem, that people can tap into your computer. And I don't care how many security codes you have, I don't care how many passwords you have, there are people out there that can break them. If they can get into the national security system, they can get into our computer. So, and we were talking about how you know that, that the government, you don't know what they could monitor on that. And now they have cameras on your computer that you can get, and, and if the other person has one, you can see each other. Right? The government is doing it slowly, but they're doing it. Slowly, they're trying to take control of our lives. And the second people that, that are trying to take control are very mental world leaders. I, I say very mental because they, they've got to be not all there to think that they can take over. You think of Hitler. He was almost there. You know, people just said, oh, don't worry about him. Don't, he can't do anything. And then they got one big surprise. And I'm not actually sure, but I heard from somebody that that he would have won. There was one final battle, and if it would have went a certain way, if he would have won, he could have taken over the whole world. Just that one battle. And I believe that God intervened in that. And he, because he didn't want Hitler at that time to take over. And if you think of uh, Saddam Hussein, the Gulf War, how that he tried to maybe not right then take over the whole world, but he tried to take over the countries that surrounded him. And who says that he would have stopped there? Who says that he would have just uh, stopped with, I believe it was Iran, that if he would have kept going and got this one and got that one? Because he was just like Hitler. Maybe not, you know, he didn't persecute the Jews the same way and everything, but, but they thought a lot alike because they wanted control. Communists don't think that communism is dead. It's working underground. Or they've got a new name for communism, which is socialism. And it's coming up as a new name. It's the new communist movement. And they're trying to take over. They would love to have communism in each country. They would love each government to be communist. And the third person or, or thing that would love to, to take control of the earth is Satan himself. The Antichrist, he tries to take over the false prophet and so on, they all, their number one goal is for each person, person to be worshiping and to be serving them. That's what Satan wants. He wants each one of us to bow down to him. He wants everybody in the world to bow down and to worship him. But as I read in Genesis 1 and 1, it said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
And Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. See, sometimes we, we think maybe God's left us. Sometimes we think, where are you, God? But God today in 1997 is still in control. He hasn't lost any power. He hasn't just taken a little siesta on His throne. But He's not playing chess with the angels. You know, He's looking over us. He's looking over this world, and He knows what's going on. He knows what's going on in everybody's life. And He hasn't said... Satan, you're too much, I'm going to let you have your way. Oh, I can't take the government. They're too strong for me. But nobody can defeat God. Nobody can take over His power. Praise God. And He is today watching over us. He is guiding us. And He is in control. Praise God. Now when, when I say that, I, I want to clarify something and say that you know, we, God made us that we all have a will. We all can choose what we want to do. When I, when I talk about control, I'm not saying that, that God, every, you know, when I move my hand up, God did it. Or if I, if I walk this way, God did it. Or if I did something that, that God did it, that, he's, that, that we're like angels. We're not. We, if God tells us to do something, we cannot do it if we want to. We can say no. But if we allow it, God can be in control of our lives. And He is in control. Because when it finally comes down to it, whether we want to bow or not, we are going to bow. We are going to confess. He's, he's been so gracious that He's allowed us, you know, to be our own person. But at one time or another, God will say, that's it. It's over. You've had your chance. I've wanted you to do it on your own. But that's it. That's it. There's no more time. There's no more chance to come to me. This is it. So God, He is in control. If we look at Joseph's life, Joseph, he had some dreams. And God, He was in control of Joseph's life. Joseph, he was one of the twelve sons of Jacob. And Joseph was a favorite. Jacob, he loved him the most. And uh, his brothers hated him for that. They despised him. So Joseph, he, he had two dreams. He had one dream, and I'm just going to leave a few things out because it's, it's a long story and I could be here all day just on that. But uh, Joseph had two dreams. The first one he had is he goes to his brothers and he says, I'm in a field, and you're in a field with me. And my bundle of grain comes up, rises up, and all of your bundles come up too, and they bow down before my bundle. And uh, his brothers get pretty upset over that. You know, he, Joseph, he was a, you know, he, God was using him, but he just didn't, you know, he was a little naive. He just didn't know how to go about it right then. And so Joseph, he has another dream. And he goes to his father, plus his brothers with this, and he says, I had a dream, and the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And, and this was just the icing on the cake. You know, his, his brothers just couldn't take any more of, of Joseph. You know, who does he think he is? Telling us that we're going to bow down before him. And uh, so one day the brothers, they were tending the sheep. And uh, the, Jacob, he says to Joseph, I want you to go and get your brothers. So Joseph, he goes and and the brothers are sitting off, you know, just talking amongst themselves. And they, they see Joseph a little ways away and they say, let's kill him. Let's kill him. That no good Joseph, he thinks that we're going to bow down to him. Let's just get rid of him and we'll show him. And uh, Reuben, he speaks up and he says, no, he, he's our flesh. We can't kill him. Let, let's not kill him. So then they decide that, that they're going to they're gonna throw him in a pit and that they're going to sell him to slavery. And, and I believe at that time that when Reuben spoke up, that it was that God that moved him to speak up. 
Because you see, if they would have killed him, Joseph's dreams wouldn't come true. Because God gave Joseph those dreams, and Joseph believed that they were going to come true. Because God was in control of that situation. Even though it didn't look good, God was in control. He could change a person's thoughts. He could change their anger. He could change what they're thinking to make it differently. And so they decide that they're going to sell him. And they go back to his father and say, you know, they, they bring his coat. It's all torn in blood. And they tell the father that he's dead. So then we're in Egypt. And the people that bought him, they, they sell Joseph to Potiphar. And he's a big guy in the army. You know, he's got a lot of say. He's the commander in chief. And, and he buys Joseph. And it says that, that Joseph, that God was with Joseph. And that Joseph prospered. And Potiphar, he, he saw that God was with him and that everything he did, that it was good. So he says, I'm going to give him all of my affairs to take care of. He's going to be the one that's in control of it. And you know, things are going really great for Joseph. and He's, he's kind of second in command of Potiphar's house. Things are going really good for him. And then comes along a woman. Isn't that the fall of every man? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I'm just kidding. But Potiphar's wife, she comes along, and she she kind of, you know, uh, gets to liking Joseph, and and she goes over to Joseph when nobody else is home, and and says, Joseph, why don't you come and lie with me? And Joseph, he says, you know, basically he said, Hey, Potiphar gave me everything to look after in this house except you. So why would I sin against God? And so Joseph, he keeps saying no. And the woman, the wife, she's persistent. You know, she wants, you know, when a woman wants something, they go after it. And uh, I know all about that. But, uh, you know, sh I'm talking about shopping and stuff. So, uh, <laughs> so Potiphar's wife, she, she, she keeps after Joseph. You're blushing, dear. But, uh, you know, Potiphar's wife, she, she keeps going after Joseph. And finally, Joseph, he says no. And when he runs out, he leaves his garment, part of his garment there. So she's pretty upset with him. And so she says, when, when the people of the house came in, the servants and so on, she said that basically, in our terms, Joseph tried to rape her. And when Potiphar comes home, he gets very upset. And he gets... His, his anger is towards him. And he gets thrown in prison. Everything was going great. Joseph had everything. You know, he went through one little valley in his life, but God had brought him through it. But now, he's in the prison. And I'm sure he's thinking, where's God now? You know, what happened to my dreams? God, you gave me those dreams, so what happened to them? And he was probably discouraged and down, but God helped him in that prison too. And God knew what was going on. See, God, He was still in control. He had everything under control. Joseph didn't understand it, but God did. He knew exactly what He was doing. And so, later on, Joseph's in the prison, and the butler and the baker of Pharaoh comes along. And they're thrown in. And each one of them has a dream. And Joseph, he, he interprets both of their dreams. Basically, it was the butler would live, be restored to power, and the baker would die and be hanged. So Joseph interprets them. In three days, the butler's restored, but the butler forgets Joseph. And Joseph, you know, he's down there. Man, I interpreted that dream. I told him to remember me. What happens? He forgets me. And he's, you know, probably trying to stay positive, but, you know, being in a prison, it'd be pretty hard to do that. And, uh, but... Something happens. Pharaoh has a dream. And nobody can interpret Pharaoh's dream. And then, the butler remembers, hey, there was a guy in prison who interpreted my dream. And I think that maybe God brought that back up into his mind. Just put that back in. And, and so the butler, he goes to Pharaoh and he tells him that there was this Hebrew person that that uh, interpreted our dreams, they came true. So Pharaoh, he goes and, 
and brings Joseph along and, and gets him. And Joseph, he interprets Pharaoh's dream. And he tells him that there's going to be seven years of plenty and that there's going to be seven years of famine. And that what you need to do is in those seven years of good, get all the corn and everything you can and store it up. And you need to set somebody over that. So Pharaoh, he says, well, you're a really wise man, and I'm going to set you over it. So Joseph, he becomes a captain over all the land. So here he is again. Things are going really good for Joseph. He gets out of it, and things are going great. And then the seven years of famine hit. And Joseph, or Jacob, and his brothers, they're back home, and they get the famine too. And they hear that Egypt has all kinds of food, that they've got all this bread. So jo Jacob tells his brothers to go up to Egypt and to get some bread. So they go up, and they go before Joseph. But they don't know it's Joseph. And what do they do? They bow down before Joseph. Dream number one came true. And then, so Joseph, you know, he, he knows it's them and everything, but he, he doesn't let them know that it's Joseph. So he says, well, where, is this all the brothers that you have? And then he, and so on, and it goes on. And t until the end, the father comes, and all of Joseph's family comes up, and dream number two happens, and they're both fulfilled. Because even though it may have not have went how Joseph thought, God had it all under control. He gave Joseph, Joseph those dreams, and he said, Joseph, maybe you don't realize how they're going to come true, but I'm in control of this situation. And I'm going to make sure that these dreams come true. You may not think so through it all, but they are going to because I'm in control. Praise God. Praise God. We look at David when he was to become king. God was in control of his life too. At, at the time that David was anointed to be king, Saul was king of Israel at that time. And God had anointed him, but he had become disobedient. And so God, he rejected Saul, and he says to Samuel, I want you to go in, and to anoint David. So Saul goes, Samuel goes, sorry, and he anoints David. And later on, the, the Israelites, they're fighting the Philistines. And they're battling, and, and there's a giant named Goliath. And so David, he's sent by his father to go to the battlefield to see how his brothers are doing. And David goes, he, he checks out the situation, he sees that the Israelites are losing, that nobody can defeat Goliath, and he says, I'll do it. You know, I, I'll go and fight him. And, you know, there's probably people laughing and, and people thinking, you know, this boy's going to go and fight him. We've had all the best of the army, and they can't do it. But David, he says, I'll do it. Just a shepherd boy. Just about the age of 14. And about probably a 14-year-old, probably about 5 feet, 5 inches, somewhere around there. And uh, so that, that's what David is, about 14 years old or so. And here's Goliath which is about nine feet tall. Well, I, I'd be pretty scared myself. I'd be pretty scared fighting somebody my own size. But uh, here's David going, and he says, I'll fight him. All I'm going to take is my sling and five stones, and I'm going to do it. So David, he goes, and he fights Goliath, and he wins. And David, he's probably thinking that, hey, uh, this is going great. Everything's going perfect. I just beat Goliath. Saul's asked me to come and live with him. Man, everything is going really great for me. But things go the wrong way instead of the right way for David. See, Saul, when he takes him back and, and sets him up and, and David does this and that and defeats these people, Saul begins to get a little bit jealous. And he sees that the Lord is with David. And when they go, when they parade after a, a battle and that, that they've won, the people were started to sing, and they would sing, Oh, Saul, he's, he's killed thousands. And then when David came through, they would say that David killed tens of thousands. And Saul, he began to get very upset. And he began to, to hate David. And he wanted to kill him. And Saul, many times, tries to kill David. And David, when he's running, he's probably asking himself, Where are you, Lord? 
Where are you? I, I thought I was going to be king, and Saul's trying to kill me. Here I am running for my life, and numerous times he almost did it. Where are you? I thought you anointed me to be king. But see, God had it all under control. God knew what he was doing. And as they go along, right at the end, Saul, he's in battle. And he's killed. David didn't have to do a thing. He just kept back. And Saul was killed in the battlefield. And David became king. Because God was in control of the situation. No matter how hard Saul tried to kill David, he could not do it because God said, David, you're going to be king. And if I say something, it's going to come to pass. It doesn't matter what's against you. It doesn't matter who's against you. But if I say it, it's going to happen. Praise God. Praise God. And the, we look at the world today, and God is in control of our world. Hebrews 2 and 8 says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under His feet. For in that He put all in subjection under Him, He left nothing that is not put under Him. But now we see not yet all things put under Him. See, God, He is con in control of our world. You know, one thing that really gets me is, is all these uh, people that predict the weather. You know, you listen to the radio, and oh, it's going to be sunny all week. It's going to be 27 out, and there's not going to be a cloud in the sky. What happens the next day? It's pouring raining. You know, or they'll say, oh, we're going to have rain the next day. What is it? The sun's out. You know, I think it's just God saying, hey, you can have all your weather things you want. You can have all the stuff that you want to pre predict the weather, but I'm still in control of it. And if, I, if you say that it's going to rain, I can change it if I want to. I can make it be sunny. If you say it's going to be sunny, I can say it's going to rain, and it'll happen. And, you know, we have all these scientists telling us that, that the earth is slowly destroying, being destroyed, that the ozone is deteriorating, that pollution is, is destroying our air, destroying our water, and all these scientists are spending millions of dollars to find a new place for us to live. You know, they're on Mars right now with the robots checking everything out. They've gone to the moon many times to see if it can sustain life. But see, they're, they're looking for the wrong thing. They should be looking for Jesus' return instead of looking for a place to live. They need to be getting ready for His return. Because myself, I don't believe that we're going to go somewhere else. That we're going to have time to go to Mars or Jupiter or wherever it is because God's coming back. And we need to be ready to meet Him when He comes. Praise God. Praise God. And you have Satan who's trying to destroy our lives. Who's just trying to destroy this world with suicide, drugs, alcohol, AIDS, cancer, you name it, Satan is trying to destroy us. And he, and there's wars, and there's nuclear weapons, and there's all of these things that are taking place, and we hear about them every day in the news. That, oh, it's coming closer to this war. This, these people are fighting themselves and, and fighting each other and, and so on and so on. But we don't have to worry about that because God, He has it all under control. Philippians 2, 10 and 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth that at, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, no matter what takes place, no matter how many wars there are, no matter how many people die of AIDS, no matter what happens, God is still in control of our world. He's still got His feet on this earth. You know, you know what I mean? God's a spirit, but figuratively. God still has His hand upon the earth. We're still in His hands. We're, he's got the whole world in His hands. Praise God. Praise God. And God, He's in control of our own lives. Matthew 6, verse 8, the last part of it says, For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. See, He knows what you need. He knows all of the things that are going on in your life. 
He knows of everything that is taking place. In Matthew 6, verses 25 to 33 say, Take no thought. If you take thought and turn it in to the English, it's take no worry. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry what you're going to put on. Don't worry what's going to happen. Because God knows what's going on. He knows what you need even before you need it. But if you'll just seek after Him, He'll take everything and turn it into good. If you'll just seek after God, He'll put everything in His hand, and He'll work it out. Praise God. If you'll just seek after God, if you'll just do what He wants you to do, God will take control. And God will, will take you through everything that you go through. Praise God. Thursday night, I was at work, and we had shut down, and we were cleaning the overhead pipe at work. And... Uh, that night, it was my job to, to clean the circular fans that we have. And uh, the ceiling, it's about 20 feet high. And I had a ladder, an extension ladder, which was 28 feet. And I had this ladder at a 45 degree angle. So the floor's here, and I had the ladder here, well, like this, up onto the ceiling. And uh, I had it really down good against something, you know, so when I get up there, it couldn't kick out or anything. So I, I begin to get up on this ladder. I'm going along, and I'm doing a little bit of bouncing, you know, getting up close to the fans. And, and uh, I'm not scared of heights, but I just, I just don't like ladders. And I look down, and I see this ladder going like this. And I've got a big bow in it. And I'm looking down, and I'm starting to breathe a little bit heavy. And uh, I'm starting to sweat a little bit. And uh, I'm thinking, because there's, there's what, on this extension ladder, there's two clips. With an extension ladder, what you can do is it's 14 feet, but if you take the second part and you move it up, it makes it grow longer. And there's two clips that are holding these two ladders together. And I'm looking at these clips very closely. And I'm thinking, if those clips break, I'm in big trouble. And because uh, it's where I was, it was all metal, and it had uh, little spikes. There were little spikes because it's for our, for our pallets to, to stay on. And I thought, if I fall, this is not going to be good. And I'd forgotten about the fans by then. And I was looking at this ladder, and, and I'd bounce on it just a little. You know, and I'd look at the cliff. And I, and I was getting pretty nervous. And, and I was at the top, and I was trying to clean the fans, but I'd clean the fan, and as soon as I'd move my arm, the ladder would shake. And I'd grab on and look at the cliff. But then, I, just something hit me, and I said, wait a minute, what am I doing here? I don't need to be afraid. God is in control of this situation. If, if I'm going to fall, it doesn't matter what I do, that I'm going to fall. If, if it's my time to go, I'm going to go. <laughs> you know, what, what's the sense of worry about it? You know, I might as well enjoy life, I might as well enjoy cleaning these fans. If, uh, if it's my time to go, hey, I'm going to go. And if it's not, then I'm not going to go. Because God is in control of it. And, you know, now, I'm not saying that, that you can say, oh, well, I'm going to get in my car and not wear my seatbelt. Because if God's in control, you know, I won't die. That, that's not how it works. You know, you've got to use a little bit of common sense and say, you know, if it's a seatbelt, you need to wear it or whatever. But even if you have your seatbelt on, 
If God says it's time for you to go, it doesn't matter if you have a seatbelt, if you have three airbags, and you're doing five kilometers an hour. If it's time for you to go, it's time for you to go. Because God is in control. So I thought, you know, I got, maybe I got a little uh, cocky because I started to bounce a little bit, you know. And I thought, man, this is pretty good. And I got calmed down and I thought, you know, God, God's in control of this situation. I'm not going to worry. You know, I haven't got time to worry about this. I'm just going to go on with it. If it happens, if it breaks, it breaks. God knows he'll take care of me. And, you know, Satan, he'll put you in those situations too. He'll put you in those situations where things are a little unstable, where you're on kind of rocky ground, where you're in quicksand, where things aren't just, you know, your, your feet aren't planted, and you're wondering, where am I going? What's going on here? Lord, I, I haven't got enough money to pay the bill. My children are sick, or I'm sick, and, and I can't get over it. And, and I can't do this. And things are just coming against me. It seems like you're not there anymore. And it seems like you just don't care about me anymore. But God is in control. God is in control if you'll just trust Him. It may, it may not work out just the way you thought it would, but it will work out. If you just let God handle it. If you just sit back, pray about it, trust in Him, and say, God, you're in control of this situation. I'm just going to trust in you. Because we are children of the King. Praise God. Hebrews 13 and 5 says that at the end, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. See, even when you're going through those lowest valleys, even when it's darker than dark, even when everything is coming against you, God is still there. God is still watching over you. Sometimes you have to go through things to make you a better person. Sometimes God puts you through something to help somebody else. But if you'll just trust in Him, if you'll just do His will, if you'll just stand beside Him and say, God, you're in control of this situation. I'm going to trust in you. And no matter what happens, I'm going to believe in you. Then it will work out. Praise God. It will work out. Praise God. Praise God. And Satan, he'll try to discourage us. He'll try to tell us that our church isn't growing. He'll tell us, you're never going to build a new church on that property. You're not going to do this. And you're just losing a battle. Give up. You can't win. You're going to be stuck here and nothing else is going to happen. But you just have to remember that Satan is a liar. He's a liar of all liars. And all you have to tell him is, hey, I've read the back of the book. I know what happens to you, Satan. If we all just overcome, we're going to make it. And you're not. You're going to be the one who loses the battle. Because we know what happens to you. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We just have to believe. We just have to trust in God. Because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It will not prevail. We just have to say in our hearts, we're going to make it. This church is going to roll on. We're going to win new people to the Lord. We're going to build a new church. We're going to reach more people. And we're going to overcome. And we're going to see Jesus when He comes. Praise God. We're going to be in heaven when Jesus comes. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Let's stand at this time. Praise the Lord.
as we sing the, the choruses to this, it's hymn 242. Praise God. Let's just anchor in Jesus today. Praise God. He is in control. He is in control. Maybe things aren't going just the way that maybe you want them to. Maybe you're going through some struggles or some trials. But if you'll just trust in Him, if you'll just anchor in Jesus, everything's going to be okay. Praise God. Because He is in control. Praise the Lord.
in Jesus, the script of life I'll pray. I've anchored in Jesus, no wind or wave, oh, I've anchored in Jesus, for he has power to save. I've anchored to the rock of ages, well, I've anchored in Jesus. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.